if you've never seen the movie Babe, you really should watch it. It is adorable. And, you know, the animals can talk and it's just super cute. But um, not really the point of what, I, <laughs> what we're talking about here. Um, so hopefully after seeing that video, you realize that um, animals may have more complex thoughts going on inside of our heads than they can represent in symbolic ways in ways that we would call language, right? And in a lot of ways, it's kind of our shortcoming because, you know, we need to figure out ways to allow them to communicate with us in ways that would show us what they know. Um, you know, we, we've got all sorts of research on what the group of birds called corvids, which include ravens and, and crows, and the things that they can remember and they can identify. You know, there have been stories going around, like um, up in Bellingham, there was a crow that was attacking passers by because apparently the crow's nest was nearby and apparently there was a particular pedestrian that this crow identified and no matter what that person was wearing had a hat on or no hat um, you know different kinds of clothing dress or, or pants different kinds of clothing on that bird recognized that individual and really had it in for him and you know this this shows that they have memories and and much more elaborate representations of the world than we've previously really appreciated. So I, I see in psychology more and more attempts to try and, and figure out ways to get animals to show us what they know inside their heads. Um, here's a really great story. Uh, if I click on this, it's probably going to start the video, but uh, see. Uh. All right. Here's a really interesting example, which is um, Kanzi the bonobo. Bonobo monkeys are... Um, very, they're a type of chimpanzee, um, very, very human-like in their behavior. Um, lo lots of really in interesting things about bonobos. Um, Kanzi was the, the son of a bonobo named Muliki, who um, got recruited by Emory University psychologists to, they tried to teach her a symbolic language. And what you're looking at here is some of the symbols that they were trying to teach Muliki. And each symbol represented something out in the world, just like any other language symbol. Um, so I can't tell you what any of them mean because they're, like any good language, arbitrary, right? Like the symbols don't necessarily relate to the object that they're supposed to represent or the behavior that they're supposed to represent. So um, they were trying to teach Muliki the association between these different um, symbols and then things out in the world or, or different behaviors and things. And she was a full grown adult. She had Kanzi. She was, you know, already a mother and Kanzi um, would come with, with her to, to work, you know, cause he was a baby. And so he had to be with his mommy. And so she would hold him and they would try and train her on the symbols, just like with the intensive training that they did with Alex, the gray parrot, so that he would learn the concepts and stuff. Um, and so they worked really hard with her and she ultimately got, I don't know, something like 10 or 15 symbols and they were mostly objects. You know, she could ask for a banana or she could ask, um, you know, go outside, things like that. But she, um, didn't really learn any like associations between the symbols or anything like that. But what was really weird is that Kanzi learned it and he was not being trained. He was just there being held by Muliki, but he learned the symbols. And so one of the things that Kanzi showed us is that they're in an animal, just like in a human, there's a critical period for language learning. And that if you miss that window, they're probably not going to be able to learn the language. And so as soon as they realized that Kanzi was learning, they started training him. And um, Kanzi now knows hundreds of symbols that are, you know, super complex. But he also is, is really, um, he has a really vast receptive language capability. So you can say just about anything to him and he can show you that he knows, he knows what you're talking about. So um, I'm going to show you a video, video of him interacting with one of the trainers and you'll see that he can, he can understand just about everything. Um, but what we're looking at here on the screen is his opportunity to produce a language, right? So if he wants um, to eat an orange outside, he could, you know, point to or press on each of those symbols and represent to the, to the trainer what he wants. I want to eat an orange outside. Um, and so his ability to produce language really gave insight into what he wanted and what he knew. Um, you might be familiar with other primates that have been taught ASL. I'm not going into them as much because there's a lot of controversy about whether um, the chimpanzees that were taught ASL or the gorillas that were taught ASL 
were making the signs that were attributed to them. Um, the, it looks to me like they did. I'll just tell you right now, my bias is it looks to me like they were expressing their thoughts. Um, while the trainer holds a doll, the chimpanzee makes a gesture for baby. That's not the per not perfect version of ASL gesture for baby. It's a little odd that they would randomly make some other gesture that happens to look very much like baby, but isn't perfectly baby. Like it just looks to me like the, it was a chimpanzee accented gesture that meant baby. So I, 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 I wasn't going to talk about the ASL controversy with the primates, but, um, I guess I am now. <laughs> I wasn't gonna, um, I personally am a believer that the chimpanzees and the gorillas who have been taught ASL have, it was not merely a projection from their trainers, but they were actually com communicating their own internal states and wants and desires and things like that. You might've seen something on the internet where, um, a gorilla was supposedly signing about how disappointed the gorilla is in humans for um, climate change. That is fake. <laughs> that is not. First off, there's a bunch of jump clips in there. And um, second off, uh, no, that the, the chimpanzees and gorillas that they've trained in ASL really can only talk about the here and now. They can't lecture about climate change. So um, please don't Please do not extend my belief in ASL with primates to um, a primate telling us about climate change. My son showed me that. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Anyway, um, so Kanzi is a great example of the need to introduce language from the beginning. You can't wait years or decades to train either an animal or a human language they need to be exposed to it from the time they're really little and they need to be exposed to it in a very interactive way. Um, putting your child in front of baby TV is not going to teach your baby language. It's just not going to work. Um, you know, baby Einstein is not going to teach your baby language. You have to have that give and take. And so, um, Kanzi is a great example of whether you're talking about humans or you're talking about other animals. Um, it needs to happen early. All right. So, I'm going to have you watch this um, video where the trainer is so desperately not wanting to succumb to um, the clever Hans effect, which is where you accidentally through your eye movements or something like that, or your facial expressions, cue the animal to what you really want. And they're not reacting to the language. They're reacting to your face. So she covers her face with a welding mask. That's why she looks like that. And then um, she's going to give Kanzi a bunch of requests and the fact that he can do all the things that she asks him to shows that he completely understands the language. Um, so this will be the last thing in the playlist. And so when I see you next, we'll be moving into chapter 10 and we'll talk about um, receiving language and we'll talk about um, reading and writing and, and those kinds of things. So I will see you in chapter 10 after you watch the Kanzi video.